In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, this evening we we enter your peace. We enter into your holy presence. Make your presence palpable to us. Help us to experience you. Help us to know you more deeply tonight. Lord, please communicate your love to us. For we are starved for love. At times, Lord, we we feel despairing. We feel that we lack answers and solutions. But yet, Lord, we draw it to you because we know that you will sustain us, that you will reveal to us at the appropriate moment the next step, the next chapter. Lord, this evening as we encounter you in your servant, St. Peter, in his letter, please speak to us and allow us to see clearly your will for each of us, to understand more deeply the intent of the scripture. We ask all these things in your blessed name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good evening. Welcome to our, our viewing audience, YouTube, and those who will listen, uh, read the transcripts on another occasion. Um, I'm glad you're here. You know, uh, sometimes we go through difficulties and I just want to encourage you that God sees your pain and your suffering and that there will be those momentary reliefs and, and rest bits that God will give you. So don't be overly burdened or feel um, distressed. Um, time passes, things change, circumstances are altered. And sometimes with our understanding we get through somehow. We get through those difficult periods. And so I encourage you with these words this evening. Do not allow your hearts to be heavy or burdened. Uh, you can't possibly manage all these things by yourself. That's why you have God. And so God is sovereign. He sees all these things and he's working in the lives of all these people. So just be cognizant of that. None of these words have any relevance, but you know, the priest has to say something. Okay. So, you know, here we are, we're gathered together, we're happy, you guys have made sacrifices, you spent money on gas coming here, gas is still cheap, you know, the teacher's cheap, and you're here, we're here to gain from one another, and as I said, it's not just simply Father Phil sharing, but we're allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our midst uh, to guide us, and we have the wisdom of the church, and these things are brought to bear, especially as holy people will come together and ask for God's help and for his revelation. And this is what he gives us in context like this where we have the really blessed opportunity to read something that is print that is more than just print. It's the actual medium by which God is communicated to us in words. And words can change people's lives, they can change nations, they can change um, human history. And so hopefully these words will do the same for us this evening. Okay, we're in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, and my gosh, we graduated to verse 2. You know, <laughs> look how far we've come. It's like, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of taking those big steps now, and we're learning how to wipe the saliva from our mouth a little bit and, and find it our way. Okay, we hear the following. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, St. Peter reveals here the tool to acquiring the grace and peace of God. What is it? Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. Knowledge of God. Okay. So, the knowledge of God is the pivotal tool to acquiring the grace and peace of God. And so now the next question of logic is, you know, what does the knowledge of God mean for Peter? What is, how does Peter understand the knowledge of God? What does it mean to Peter? If you were to ask Peter, and you, know, you ran into him at a coffee shop, you know, he probably doesn't go to Starbucks because he's not familiar with the name. You know, what, would, what would he tell you? What would St. Peter tell you? <coughs> what does it mean? Knowledge of God. It's really a, it's a, it's a large it's a large term. It could actually, you know, embrace a lot of things. What does it mean? If you ask the person on the street, it might mean something. What do you think it means? 
What do you think? I know we're all being humble. We don't want to talk at once. And we know the answer. We want to afford the next person the opportunity so we don't get all the credit. Okay. What do you think? Knowledge of God. What does St. Peter mean by the knowledge of God? Thinking. What do you think? Well, he walked with God. Okay. Um, I would guess em embracing the Holy Spirit. Okay, then, but we could be partially because the Holy Spirit will reveal or guide us into all truth. Okay, so that's a safe comment. Okay, what else? What do you think? Knowledge of God. No. You know, the Orthodox study Bible commentator is kind of making, he makes a comment in the, in the bottom margin. And he says that, first of all, the, the uh, St. Peter is referring to the true knowledge of God. The true knowledge of God. And where does the true knowledge of God come from? Huh? The church. The church. Okay. So it, and it is in the church that this, this knowledge is to be found. Okay. Now, does this mean if I go, to, if I walk out of the classroom and I go about 200 feet down the road to the true Jesus Church, I'm going to get this tr true knowledge of God? Well, because they're the true Jesus Church, so they must have the true knowledge, right? What do you think? No. Okay. No. Very good. That's a safe answer. <laughs> that, that one gets a double star. Okay. No. You know, you know, the, the key thing is, 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 is they lack something. But, you know, so how did this knowledge, divine knowledge, come to the church? How did it get here? Did it, was it in a manuscript that dropped out of a, a UFO, you know, and, and fell through the dome of the church? What do you think? Through the Holy Spirit. Okay. No, and so, okay. Apostolic success. Apostolic success. Okay, so now we're getting to, okay, the apostles... They're involved in the process, so they, they were. So, are you are you implying that the apostles have a special place in terms of the reception of this knowledge? Yeah, they were there. They were there. Okay. <laughs> Do you remember those books that we used to read when growing up called the We Were There series? You probably too you're, you're too young. You know? <laughs> yeah, I'm revealed by age. Joe, you better say yes. <laughs> Connie. Oh no, yes. Okay. <laughs> Connie, you know, yes. George, remember the We Were There books? I wasn't there. <laughs> You know, we were there at the Battle of, of, of Gettysburg or something. I, I love my kids. I was kind of distorted. I was kind of nerdy. I don't know. You know, I had no choice but to come a race. Okay, good attention. Okay. So, um, so it can't, this knowledge comes to us, and the apostles are one of the key venues that brings us the knowledge of God. Diana God and Joe. came down here and dwelt among us, Jesus. Okay, so... So you're saying the knowledge has been revealed to us, right? Right. Jesus revealed this knowledge to the apostles. Apostles, and Joel is going to say what? Same thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. He's going to take you back on her words. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. like that's what us was doing. The affirm what their wives say. You know. Okay. So, so it came, but it came to the church through what central? Major written document. Bigger, bigger. Oral tradition. <coughs> bigger. Scripture. The Holy Scripture, and I'm glad you said Scripture instead of Bible, because she's been listening. Mm -hmm. Remember, the the Old Testament is is the Bible. The Old and New Testament, with the Deuterocanonical books together, are called the Holy Scriptures. So you could go into class and correct everybody and say, look, you know, you just don't understand here. The Bible is really just the Old Testament, because that's what it's called, Tavivlia, you know, the books. The books, that's a reference to the Old Testament, you know. The correct word is the Holy Writings, which is the Holy Scriptures, you know. The Aya Grafi, the, the Aya Foli Grafi, the writings, right? Okay, that's the correct word. And so, and so the knowledge of God, because the, the apostles couldn't live forever on earth, so they had to they had to dedicate something to writing, correct? And was Luke an apostle? No, no, because he was one of the evangelists. Okay, was he an apostle? Cool. 
Not an original not twelve. An original. Okay, he wasn't he wasn't part of the the the, the, the tribe the, the, the pack of twelve. You know, it's kind of like, the, but but he was part of the, he was part of the seventy, right? So he was part of the seventy apostles. Okay, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the writers of the first four, the the books, the, the evangelists, the gospels. You know, um, Mark was not really he was one of the seventy, and he was he was a disciple of Peter, as was um, Luke. You know, helped Paul in some of his missionary activity, but Matthew was an apostle, and John was an apostle. Okay. And the others were, were apostles who, who contributed to the to the New Testament. Okay, so the Holy Scriptures are filled with the knowledge of God. And so can you think of any good reason why we shouldn't read them? Well, I'm, I'm too busy watching The Voice. Or, you know, <laughs> or, you know because Idol is at this time. Or, you know, I need to, to see... CNN, so I'll know when the world's going to end. You know, okay. You know, and you know, I can't think of no good reason why we shouldn't read the Holy Scriptures. And yet, you know, I mean, it's it's food. There's wealth in here. And if I told you that it would that this information would make you a multi-millionaire, would you read it? Well, you'd read me right all over it. You know, you know, we'd have. People, you know, come in and, and looking for copies because it's the key to, and it is, it's the key to spiritual wealth. If you want to be happy, you've got to go to this. Now, I'm not talking about pseudo happy, so we're going to get into that and talk about some of these false, you know, I, all I want to be is happy, you know, well, uh, uh, good for you. But, you know, the happiness you're looking for is not, is not, is not lasting. It's, 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 um, it's flighty, it's deceiving. Okay, so what else? You have the Holy Scriptures. That's one source of true knowledge of God. What else is there? We have the, the, the teaching of the 12 apostles. You know, they wrote a book called the Vidahi, which means the teachings, okay, of the 12, of Tonoveca. And so they, they taught, they, have, they commented about how to do baptisms. You know, they cut, you know, how to conduct the, the Lord's Supper. And these are the things that are included in the few chapters that are part of the Vidahi. It's, it's all comprised of there. And so these are the teachings of the, the Holy Twelve Apostles. Father. Yes. Why is that not as important as the Holy Scriptures? Why is that not, I mean, you don't see that next to well, the Bibles in the stores. Well, the key thing is, is that when the church had to close the New Testament canon, it had to make a choice. There are many inspired books, but the corpus or the the fundamental detail was centered around Christ, and so it had to be about his life rather than the life of Thomas or Peter or or what happened to you know Jesus in his infancy, you know you know the key thing is is it had to be Christ centered predominantly, and they had to make a choice you know because you know you have other gospels. You know, that were written too, and some were, were were good. And you have you know the letter of Clement, almost got in. So, you know he was the one of the you know, the second bishop of Rome. Okay, and you have you know, the martyrdom of Polycarp. You know, and yet they had to close it because what was happening is, is there were these false teachers that were surfacing, that were trying to take an apostle's name and put on their books, so they would have distributorship and they would make money. Okay, and that people will come follow them and donate to them because they supposedly had a connection with the 12. As so there was a lot of false documents floating, studio, you know, statements, studio Dionysios and others. And that Dionysius was the first bishop of Athens who was, who was converted by St. Paul. And so you have to be very careful of the false documents. So the church was forced to close them. Doesn't mean we don't have. Uh, the post-apostolic fathers, and we don't have you know, Clement and the Marty de Polygar and the letters of St. Ignatius and others that are very instrumental and helpful. You know, even some of the writings of Tertullian are helpful. You know, and, and some of the writings of Origen. And so you have post-apostolic fathers that were roped and some of their writings were rejected. But, you know, <clears throat> the key thing is, is that um, you have to draw the line somewhere, and so this became the central corpus that comprised the Holy Scriptures. Now, some of these later people became saints, 
And so their information also is included. Now, don't be locked into this mentality. You get, if it's not in the Ayagrafi, the Holy Scriptures, therefore it's, it's, it's not important. Okay, Because the lives of the saints are filled with inspiration and truth. Okay, And the church says they're inspired, right? Okay, so they're included. And so, but yet nothing will exceed the central written document of the church, which is the Holy Scriptures. Okay? Nothing will exceed it. Nothing will contradict it. And so you have to have the standard. And that's the standard. Can you think of other sources of the knowledge of God? What do you think? What do you think? Oral tradition, oral tradition. Okay, oral tradition. Yeah, there were things that were orally passed on. You know, sayings about the mother of God. You know, sayings about the apostles. Things that were perhaps written in other documents later. But oral customs that were passed on by word of mouth, okay, and they were considered to be valuable, just as valuable as the written letter. Very important for us to know that, especially as we dialogue with those outside of the historic church, especially the Protestant milieu that we live in. You know, they need to know that, and they need to honor the scriptures and what the scriptures say, which say, which validates the oral tradition. Okay, another. Great body of literature is what? The seven ecumenical councils. Okay? You know, because in them is revealed truth. You know, about doctrine. What do we believe about Jesus? What do we believe about the Holy Trinity? What do we believe about the hypostatic union when the Holy Spirit conceived, you know, Christ in the womb of Mary? What do we believe about that? You know? What happened? What are the implications of that? You know, um, how do you handle people that are lapsed in the church? What if someone's divorced? What if somebody's this? You know, what if somebody uh, steals from the church? What do you do? What if somebody pays to become a bishop? How do you handle that? You know, you know, simony, you know, the, you know, the practical issues of, of managing the body of Christ are, are dealt with in the canons, you know. And the seven ecumenical councils basically defines the truth about God and about the mother of God and about the two natures of Christ and the two wills. And about iconography, all these things are affirmed, you know, in and through the ecumenical councils. And also in the regional councils, you know, the Council of Carthage revealed to us what the contents of the New Testament are, the 27 books. Also, this is also affirmed for us in, uh, in the, in the, in the um, canons of the saints, St. Saint Basil, there are canons that St. Basil wrote, you know, it became, you know, um, that have value to the church. So you have the canons, you have the Holy Scriptures, you have the ecumenical regional councils. Where else do we get the knowledge of God? Holy Fathers. The Holy Fathers, okay? Lives of the saints, okay? What else brings us the knowledge of God? How about communion? Communion, yes, yeah. The sacraments bring us knowledge of God because they, they open our hearts to the experience of God, then God reveals His truth to us. Okay. Okay. So you have um, hymnology. Okay, the hymns of the church. You think that just somebody sat down, uh, you know, at an ice cream shop and decided, well, I'm going to write a hymn about Saint Basil, and uh, I'll put it in the the basket of church, and then the church is going to sing it. No, you know, they they prayed and they read his life and they wrote, you know, the Apologetica and the Condicia. And so, and also the you know the services of the church, filled with the knowledge of God. You know, if you come to an ortho service or vespers, you have the lot. If we were to do like a monastery, you'd read the entire life of the saint. You know, after the reading of the Synexodia, which is the name of the saints that are commemorated on that day, all these things would be done. And so, you have this as another vehicle by which we come to the knowledge of God, the hymnology, the sacred services, also the inspired architecture of the church. The very design of the church teaches volumes. How do you think orthodoxy survived under communism? It was because of the iconography, the sacred art, and the church building itself, which taught volumes about the miracle of the incarnation through the dome, about the you know the two nations of Christ and about the lives of saints. You know, they became objects that people could teach from because they were pictures. The pictures are worth more than a thousand words. All these things became, you know ways that we come to the knowledge of God. And so you have all these sources, holy scriptures, holy canons, the ecumenical regional councils, the divine services, the sacred poetry. We had poets in the church. 
Theophanes the writer, you had others that were poets, you know, that would write sacred poetry, hymnology, inspired architecture, oral teachings, apostolic tradition, and the experiences of the lives of the saints, okay, are all conduits that bring us the knowledge of God. Okay, and so the key point is, don't get into this mindset of sola scriptura. Okay, translate that. Um, don't, yeah, don't try to base everything off of what is explicit in the scripture. That's right. Okay, the scriptures, okay, you know, the knowledge of God comes to us through many different means. Scriptures are the central document, which cannot be contradicted, but God continues to reveal, you know, to us, you know, and a lot of the lives of the saints, they draw from the scriptures, okay? And so really, all they, most of their time is spent living the scriptures and interpreting them for us in how to live the Christian life. Okay. I, I want to be careful. I don't want to try to create this category where some, somehow separate or belittle the Holy Scriptures, okay, the Holy holy Writings. The, uh, the key thing is, is that they are central. And that's, in, in fact, if you go to, this, to the, the great Desert Fathers, and when it comes down to it, their first fidelity is to the to, to the Holy Scriptures. They read the Scriptures. Okay, you know, they're not involved in reading the lives of 100 saints, although they enjoy it. You know, they're going to the original source that made people, which is the Scriptures, the Holy Scriptures. Okay, so in Totality, all these comprise what main source of the knowledge of God? What main source of the knowledge of God do all these fall under the umbrella of? Church. Correct, but there's another, there's another word I'm looking for here. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. What is our main source of the knowledge of God? Holy Jesus. Spirit. Tradition. No. Okay, all these things fall under the umbrella of holy tradition. And so, how would you define holy tradition? If someone says, well, what do you mean by holy tradition? You Orthodox, what are you going to say? That's that thing that makes me different from you. Yeah, okay, okay, well, that is true. Okay, but how, do, how are you going to define it? What is holy tradition? How can we define holy tradition? I've heard some people say that there's two categories, capital T and small t. Okay, but I'm talking about the capital. How do we define capital T holy tradition? It's just what you said. You okay. Believing in one creator. Okay, okay. Let me let me kind of say it simply to you, okay? <coughs> All good points. Holy tradition is the ongoing dialogue between man and God from the beginning of time to our present day. Okay? The ongoing dialogue between man and God from the beginning to our present day. So can holy tradition still grow tomorrow? Yeah, because God, because God can reveal to us how to respond to a different challenge. You know, how are we going to respond to stem cell research? You know, how are we going to re respond to those who are trying to, to somehow, um, you know, <coughs> Clone. You know, the church has to provide an answer. And this is how the Holy Spirit works. It, it takes the scripture and the combined knowledge of the church into our present day and the present challenge to speak truth as to where we stand. Okay, so can holy tradition be added to? Technically, yes. However, this new knowledge cannot do what? It cannot contradict the Holy Scriptures. There will, no, there will be no revelation that will exceed the person of Jesus Christ. It's not going to introduce a Mohammed or a behemoth or whatever. Okay? <laughs> you know, it's supposed to be super, you know, because that would be total contradiction and falsehood. So it can't contradict anything that has been revealed prior. Does this imply that God did not reveal the fullness of truth or knowledge to the church in the beginning? No, it doesn't. Okay, so the church. So you're telling me the church received from the very beginning the fullness of truth. Yes, you're correct. It re, and received the fullness of truth from whom? Christ. 
Christ. Okay. For Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay. And so the fullness of the Godhead bodily we've experienced encounter Jesus Christ reveals to us the life giving Holy Trinity. Okay, so although I've listed so many sources of holy tradition by which the knowledge comes to us, what is the primary activity by which we receive this knowledge? Barnes and Nobles? Prayer. Prayer. Prayer is absolutely correct. Prayer. Prayer is, because that's how they received it, right? The saints, you know, how do they receive the knowledge of God? They spent time on their knees, you know, and they said, God, show me what I need to change. And then as they cooperated with God, they started changing. They started to see things and learn things because their eyes were open and they could perceive things and their soul was open to seeing the truth. So this is why St. Gregory of Nicaea says that the true theologian is the one who prays, okay? It's the person of prayer, okay? That person who spends time on their knees. They may not have a PhD from, you know, from Dallas Theological or from, you know, that's not a school. Okay. Okay. <laughs> or St. Vladimir Seminary, Holy Cross, Greek Orthodox School of Theology. But you know, in practical experience, they may know more about God than the person who gets to wear a rasso or cassock, you know? In fact, sometimes they would come up to me in my first years of priest and they would tell me what to do and what such and such meant. And, you know, and I, I listened. And I learned, and I tripped, and I grew. Um, I'm still tripping. Okay. Okay, so something just to ponder. Okay, so so the, tree, the true theologian is the one who prays. So what type of prayer leads to this knowledge? <coughs> what type of prayer leads heartfelt, to this knowledge? Heartfelt prayer. Okay, constant heartfelt prayer. That moves one to what? A constant state of repentance and that moves in a fixed dependency on who? God. Every saint was totally dependent on God. They knew they couldn't do anything without God. And so it became their primary effort to always stay close to God. This is what they chose to do. So when so when we do this, what happens? When we are constantly involved with, with constant repentance and, and a fixed dependency on God, what happens then? What happens to us? When you do this, what will happen to you? Revelation and change. Yeah, yeah. God reveals himself to us. God will reveal himself to us. And when he does that, what does he give us? Grace and peace. Okay, grace and peace, okay. Or the fullness of truth. Knowledge, godly knowledge, or skills. No. <laughs> that would, um, was uh, Marshawn Lynch, he would get candy from the sideline before the game. Skills. <laughs> skills. Skills. Okay. I don't even know they have candy anymore. That's how little I, you know, I you know, my favorite candy bars are what? Snickers, okay. Almond Joy, Mounds. <laughs> yeah. Milky Way. Okay. I said payday. Okay, payday, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Payday is always a good day. <laughs> okay, so um, can you think of times when the understanding of truth, i.e. godly knowledge, came to you when praying, worshiping, or receiving the holy mysteries? Can you think or recall? Okay, Connie says yes. Okay, Steve says yes. Okay, can you remember? <laughs> okay, Steve, what do you remember? Uh, his unconditional love for me. Okay. Okay, that was affirmed mm -hmm. after receiving communion. Mm -hmm. You felt that. Okay. Connie, do you recall? Well, I recall an issue that I was struggling with and praying very hard about it. And uh -huh. I can remember the moment it became very clear and so simple and uh -huh. that it seemed somewhat not silly, but that I couldn't see it earlier yeah. at, as clearly and simple as it became to me. Uh -huh. It was so evident mm -hmm. um, that it had been there, you know, before me the whole time. It was just mm -hmm. yeah. waiting for it to, for me to realize it. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, your, your eyes open up and everything's timing. Uh -huh. The timing is perfect. Yeah, the timing is perfect. And all of a sudden, just it's like um, all of a sudden there's this whole light bulb that goes on. Oh my gosh! Yeah, you feel like a little kid again. Yeah, and you can see the you can see the entirety of the issue as Scotty surmised very simply. It all becomes so obvious. In fact, perhaps we were so tunnel vision into it we couldn't see the the simple reality, and the simple truth that, that prevailed. And I think everybody has their own story. I mean, I can, you know, my own discoveries of a spiritual thing. And, and they, they occur when we pray and ask. And we persist. And, and one of the, the best times to receive answers is right after communion. In fact, I encourage people just to go up be by yourself after communion. Just kind of sit in the church and just kind of, you know, say, Lord, you know, show me. Because, because God is right in you. You have communion. So it's the time par excellence for the giving of answers. So take advantage of it. Okay, so, and you know, sometimes, you know, as we grow spiritually we, and we repent and we confess, what happens is when we read the scriptures, we see new things, things that we didn't see before. Have you encountered that in your readings? You know? And, uh, you know, who was I talking to uh, a week and a half ago? I was talking to Justin, and he was relating that his conversion to Orthodoxy, and that now, after his chrismation and receiving the sacraments, when he looks at Scripture, he's seeing things he never saw before. And it's just, you know, it's just, um, he's awestruck with it. Just, you know, how can I see this all of a sudden now? And yet he's been a student, you know, about six, seven years in seminaries, Protestant seminaries, where, you know, all kinds of scholasticism and such. And he couldn't see those things. And now it's just, it's there, you know. If you want to know the end, you know, the hardest thing is to ask for truth about yourself. You know, that's a, that's a scary prayer. Oh, Lord, show me as I truly am. You know, and then, then all of a sudden, oh, yeah, oh, my gosh. I'm pretty ugly. You know, especially I'm pretty ugly. You know, I've got, I've got this stuff here. i got that I'm dealing with. And, and you feel very humble. You know, you say, you learn to bow your head and say, yes, I am earth. You know, and, and yet, you know, God does that because he teaches us that we need him. And don't be afraid to lean on him constantly. You were the smallest things. The saints do. You know, what do you think in the monasteries? They're always asking for a blessing for everything. You know, <clears throat> they have, you know, can I bless to get a cup of simple water? Can I get, you know, you know, and, and, and because they're learning to, to obey and to ask for everything. And, through that, we learn to ask God for everything, for our sustenance. Lord, get me through the day. You know, get me through the six-hour class, you know, with the kids. It gives my patience a shot, and I don't know if I'm, you know, and I think I'm coming out of the cold. And, you know, and so we're praying for these things constantly. You know, and he wants us to learn to depend on him because he wants to help us. And that's a key thing is God wants to help us. I think sometimes, you know, much of our response in life is self-destructive and self-punishing because we, you know, our pride will not allow us to receive help because some, somehow we've convinced ourselves we can do it on our own, you know, do it my way. And so we don't want to receive, yet the humility says receive it. And this is really where power is when you are open to totally receiving. And even if somebody, even if an alcoholic comes up to you after a class and says, and, <clears throat> and talks to you, you to receive something from that person. Well, Father, he might be dangerous, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, if you can't run an alcohol, alcoholic, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, God will protect you. The key thing is, is that we, we can learn something from everybody. Even if you're, if you're working next to an idiot, that idiot will teach you things that will be helpful to you. Okay, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way because in many ways they'll exceed us. You know, uh, Henry Nell, the, the Catholic uh, theologian who wrote some very good books on spirituality and was very sympathetic to Eastern writers and authors in Orthodoxy. You know, spent time at um, at a home for the mentally retarded, and and the mentally retarded taught him more than he learned at, at seminaries and pursuing you know doctorates and so. You know, they taught him a lot about life and love and about simplicity. 
in the simple duties of just respect and joy, simple joy. We've lost touch of the simple joys of life. You know, we need to recapture that. But, but in order to do that, we've got to be willing to uh, be willing to learn and to listen to what we're yeah. being told or uh -huh. being taught. Because uh -huh. it's usually in a circle where mm -hmm. it's not coming to us straight. Uh -huh. And if we're not in that learning mindset, we're going to miss it because it's going to go right over our heads. Okay. So what does Jesus mean by that he wants us to become like a child? Children absorb everything. Okay. okay. They have an open mind, an open ear. What else? Simple, innocent. Okay. S simplicity. Simplicity of life, simplicity of, of faith. You know, don't get too complex. No. And although our theology is very rich and deep, you know. In their heart. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, continuing. Where are we going to end up today? Only God knows. Okay. So, um,. So the mysteries, they help us. Holy Scriptures become much more clear to us. Um, and we see them in a new light that we never saw before. How is Jesus our Lord the portal to our knowledge of God? How is Jesus the portal of knowledge? To the knowledge of God. <coughs> How is he the portal to the knowledge of God? This is the life gives us an okay. example of how okay. we should be living our own. Okay, okay. I think Connie, you, made it. you said grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You know, which actually was a quote from uh, the Gospel of St. John, chapter 1, verse 17. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And so, what is grace? <coughs> the uncreated energies of God. So that's the personal presence of God. So he brings <coughs> us the personal presence of the Trinity. He brings it to us. He communicates that to us. And um, in truth, in truth is knowledge. The truth is knowledge of of, of life. And now, I'm not going to say that he's coming here to give you, you know, quantitative physics, you know, equations and theories, although he knows everything. And, you know, and everything he knows because he's God, he has all knowledge, and he does knowledge all these things. But these aren't essential to your, your spiritual pursuit unless you're to write a treatise to convince, you know, atheists and scientists to believe in God. You speak it on their, their own lingo. Okay, so grace and truth is from Jesus Christ. Okay, so in John 15, 15, Jesus says, For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. No, that means knowledge. He has knowledge to us, okay? So he has given, he's communicated this knowledge that, he's, that the Father has given, he's, he's, he's given it to us. So it's, hence, it is Jesus Christ the Son of God, who is the revealer of this knowledge. He is the source of all the knowledge that comes to us under the guise of holy tradition and all the subcategories of holy tradition. You're actually giving kind of a seminary class here, too. So yeah. you go to seminary, you won't have to study this hard. Okay. Is, that, Father, is that what separates us from the other uh, faiths? Because I know some of the other um, faiths, they focus on the intellect. Yeah, the, the intellectual the study of the scripture. And, and that's just mistaken because yeah. even the Holy Father said you must pray before you read. And yet you must have the mind of the church before you approach the scripture because the, the scriptures were written for what? Yeah, they weren't, they weren't written for somebody who was outside the church. They were written for somebody in the church. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because they're only understood in the church because it was written for the church. But the way the church functions and lives its life and, and, and teaches and worships and prays is implied in the scriptures. And so, you know, it's like, you know, reading an automobile manual when you don't know what an automobile is. You know, say, well, you know, what's a, what's a muffler? You know, what's a manifold? What, you know, you know I mean, if you don't know the basic things of, of how it's constructed in, in the basic terms, how can you even begin to understand it? And this is why they have, you know, 20, 30,000 different denominations because they don't know the lingo, they don't know what it was written for in the context it was written in and how it was understood in the historic church because somebody told them that somehow the church lost its way or, you know, and that, you know, it was man-made a lot of the things that the church did, you know, and they believe it, you know, and they'll just summarily dismiss 
the you know a history of the church for the first ten centuries, and we'll begin with with a guy named Martin Luther, or, or Zwingli, or Calvin, and so, and so that's where the church really becomes understandable because it was kept secret till then, and that's really a lie from the pit of hell. We must you know reject that type of thinking, and realize that there's much more here, you know, there's much more in the scriptures. Okay, so. Um, Grace, no, he says in verse, we're still in verse 2 here, I apologize. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. Now, why does St. Peter refer to the multiplication when trying to quantify or measure the grace and peace that comes to us in the knowledge of God? Why does he use, why does he refer to multiplication here? Why does he do so? Because our knowledge of God can only increase. It will never... Okay. So it's not a simple just addition system, small little increments. He says, you know, because he's trying to describe a quality of the knowledge of God. What is that quality? Hmm? It's all good. Infinite. It's infinite. It's infinite. So that's why he's using multiplication. Or he's actually using... <coughs> You know, exponential numbers to describe, you know, to the nth degree. And so he does so to reveal to us the vastness and depths of godly knowledge and wisdom and understanding. And, you know, this is what St. You know, uh, Paul understood in his letter to the church at Rome, chapter 11, verse 13. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. You can't even reach out to the point to understand, you know, the things of God sometimes. It's so far beyond us. And so um, it's good for us to know that. In fact, how does he compare the foolishness of God to the wisdom of men? What does he say? He says the, he says the foolishness of God is superior to the wisdom of man. He says, you know, I get kicked out of Rush Limbaugh. He says, that, you know, if he could tie half his brain back, you know, he, he would still be smarter than everybody else. And, you know, you know, the key is that, you know, God could use one millionth of his brain and it would still exceed, you know, the fullness of human knowledge, you know. And we have to understand that. And, um, and that's part of, the, part of the reason that we have to be humble. you got to know your place, Okay. You have to know, acknowledge and recognize your place of God, which is a position of profound humility. And that's why the more people who grew closer to God, they became more humble. And they bent over more. And they had more frustration. They were very careful. And they were very careful how they treated every person. Why? Why? Why were they careful? Because they live in constant fear of others? No. Huh? What Jesus said about the least of my love. Yeah, yeah. Because the closer you get to God, what do you see? God. You see God in everything. You see God even in the even in the center. You see the potential for goodness. And so you're very careful, you're very respectful of all of human life and all created life and life forms. You're you're so careful. Because there's awareness. Because you approach and you see life it's totally different. And this is what happens as you reach that level where all of a sudden life is seen from a whole, whole different vantage point. It's not all about what you can get or who you can take or or what you can accomplish and what, what accolades you can receive. It's all about, you know, awareness, you know, knowledge of God. That's the that's the pearl of great price. Okay. Is to know, to know God. Okay, that's a good I do for a sermon. I'll show you the pearl of great price. Okay. What do I know about anything? Okay, grace and truth be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. <coughs> so, you know, we can't measure <coughs> God's knowledge. And then, yet that's in, exciting and stimulating because in the whole future life, <coughs> on the other side of death, we're never going to become exhausted or bored, you know. You will be constantly challenged, and you'll be just 
entering more and more knowledge. It's like walking through a mist and seeing and discovering new things every second. And that's like so exciting because to imagine yourself in that context where there's this constant awareness and growth. In the words of, of St. Peter and Gregor Nisa, you know, going from glory to glory. Because when you speak of glory, you're referring to, to knowledge and light, awareness. And so you're moving closer and closer, and you're seeing and learning and growing and encountering so many new things, wonderful things, that there's no end to it. And so there's no sense of tiredness or emptiness. You're just totally absorbed in God. I can't understand that. Hmm? Well, it sounds good, though. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No, we can't. We can't. We can't even begin to fathom that from it, from this. Event. And it's so well stated. We, you know, how can we wrap our our mind around that right now? Uh, we can just say, "Wow, you know, it sounds intriguing." You know, I want to be there. You know, I want to go there. And uh, yet, we we all have the option and the ability to be there. God opens the doors for this for this to happen. Continuing. Verse 3. Can you believe it? That's all we did all. We only did one verse all that. Oh. As the divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. As his divine power has given us all things. Now, my question is this. How are we to understand this divine power, as St. Peter refers to her, how are we supposed to understand divine power? Is this like a um, one of these, you know, lace caffeine drinks you get at uh, Circle K to give you, what is it called, jolt? Bolt? Jolt? Huh? You know what that drink is called? Bolt? Huh? Huh? You know about anything about these things, Daddy? Kickstart? Okay. Okay. Joel, or okay. So, so what is, so how are we to understand this whole idea of divine power? As his divine power has given us all things. What does St. Peter mean here by divine power? What do you think? Okay, yeah, Joseph says, God. 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 Yeah, he's, you know, he's, he's getting out there, he's just, you know, I hope it's right. Yeah, and actually he's correct, okay? Because this is to be understood as the very activity of the uncreated energies in our lives. It's the very activity. It's God in action, okay? And so we're seeing, we're feeling, you know, the shake and the movement, you know, of the activity of the Trinity as it's moving and accomplishing and doing. And... Um, Imagine Moses' experience of the power of God as the Red Sea parted. What do you think his experience of the power was as he saw this happen? What would you do? If you were there at the Red Sea and you saw it parting, you know, these 100-foot walls of water opening up for you, what would be your, what would be your experience? You know, what would you think? Uh, if you were there, Steve, what would you be thinking? Incredible love that he cares that much that he wants to save me from where I'm coming from. Yeah, yeah, incredible love. And, you know, and yet <coughs> profound awe. In fact, you know, he, jaws are probably hanging on the ground. And just say, well, you know. Think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you, know, you just can't begin even to fathom. You're just saying, oh, my, my Lord. And, you know, and then you very quickly <laughs> get out of the program. <laughs> okay. Because, you know. Sometimes good things uh, don't last forever. We have to be careful, you know. So just you know something to ponder, you know. So it's it's the very activity of his uncreated energies. This is the divine power that is referred to here by Saint Peter. And this power or energy is both. Can it be measured? No. no. Because God can't be measured. Okay. And would it be correct to say that it's super efficient. Hyper efficient, he will use a Greek. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And it's good. First of all, it's a miracle. It's omnipotent. And it's super efficient in growing us into what? What does it grow us into? 
a freak show called the church? No. What does it grow us into? Okay. Holiness. Yeah, it's savia, okay, you know, piety, you know, grows us into sainthood, okay? That's what the power of God does, because we allow it to work in us. You know, you know, Saint Peter on the day of Pentecost, he preaches and, and, and thousands convert, okay? Was that Peter? He was just having a good day? <laughs> at a, at Got a real st stiff cup of coffee and got to open all his thought processes, or he can he can actually be coherent and, and talk. You know, he wasn't he wasn't educated. Okay, he was a fisherman. You know, you know how fishermen talk, right? Arr. No, <laughs> no I, <Arr>. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but no, he. You know, something happened profound. You know, the Holy Trinity moved and shook in him. The activity of the of the triune God was manifested in his speech and and the words that were laced together. You know, that only happens for us easy when we're talking ill with somebody. Then the devil weaves the words together. We can be very destructive. But yet God can do the same thing and much more superiorly than that. And this is what happened in the preaching of St. Peter on the day of Pentecost. People were captured. They were engrossed in his every word. And afterwards, even people have been raised in Judaism their whole lives. They converted after one speech. You know, can you imagine that? After one speech, you know. And um, well, I, 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 I kind of wonder, you know, what would it have been like to to be in the crowd there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and to hear St. Peter's speech and to understand, you know, the Hebrew that he spoke at the time, you know. I mean, you know, it's, you know I mean, look what happened when uh, Martin Luther King gave his, you know, you know, his speech, I have a dream. And look how many lives were influenced by that one speech. Okay? If if Peter had the form of of um, where did he give the speech from? Was it Lincoln's memorial? Where where did he give it from? Do you remember? Lincoln Memorial? Okay, now imagine if 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 Peter had the the advantage of speaking from the Lincoln Memorial and the power of God was manifest in his preaching, as it was, the potential. And I, I think we need to do this and that. We have to understand the impact of what really occurred in an idiom that we understand, you know, in a comparable, you know, um, setting. Okay, so this so this power or energy is immeasurable, it's omnipotent, and it's super efficient in growing us into holiness. It's there to grow us into the holy people of God. So Continuing to verse, verse 3. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. What are these things that God has given to us? Hmm? All things. And what are all these things? What has he given to us? What we need to continue our life in him. Yes, yes. We'll continue next week, right? In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord, you are our teacher. You are the very one who will guide us into the fullness of truth. Lord, we open our hearts and our minds to receive true knowledge, which only comes from you and the church that you've bestowed it to. We ask, Lord, that you would protect us from false knowledge that you would secure our minds and hearts, and that you would purify them of the passions. And Lord, we uh, especially pray for those that are struggling in our lives. We pray for the diffusion of our own confusion. We pray, Lord, for the stilling effect of your presence. We pray, Lord, that peace would be communicated to us through the confusion that we presently encounter. Lord, we pray uh, for healing of our wounded hearts, how people have wounded us and hurt us that you would restore and heal them. Lord, we pray for our bodily wounds. We pray for our anxieties and anxiousness, that you would calm them, and you would give us clarity of thinking. Lord, we ask for the ability to make the right decisions and to please you with all that we do and say. Lord, we ask for the gift of, of control of speech, that we would speak things that would please you. We especially, Lord, uh, pray for those that are struggling throughout the world especially those in Syria, Iraq, 
in the countries, Lord, where, where martyrdom is experienced. We pray for those that are wounded, those that are senselessly hurt and killed. Lord, that their memories be eternal, and that you, Lord, would allow us the ability, Lord, to be in your lights to a world that is starving for truth. And give us the strength, to, Lord, to have courage to stand for you. And in so doing, Lord, to embrace what you will give us. We ask this in your name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.